Good afternoon, everybody. It's Mary Rowe from CUI. Welcome back to City Talk, um, a series of candid conversations on what's working, what's not, and what's next during cities in the time of COVID. Um, I work at CUI, and we are uh, very pleased to have uh, participants, these four participants joining us today. We are having uh, conversations like this every couple of days. Uh, we had a couple last week. We are having three this week. Um, and uh, the work of CUI is really being propelled by volunteers and partner organizations across the country. Uh, I'm hoping that you've all looked at citywatchcanada.ca and citysharecanada.ca. These are platforms where Canadians are sharing with one another what's working, what's not, and trying to learn from each other and see if we can adapt quickly to all the ch new challenges that are, have been presented to us during this. Um, I should acknowledge we're in Toronto, and uh, at least I'm in Toronto. We have panelists from across the country, but um, uh, Toronto is uh, located in a traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, and the Chippewa, and the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And it's now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples from across Turtle Island. We also want to acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, which are signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaty is signed with multiple Anishinaabek nations. And we recognize and acknowledge the ground on which we are situating ourselves. And uh, my panelists come from different places. Uh, they have different uh, attachments, but uh, we are very uh, cognizant of the context in which we have this remarkable conversation that we are having day in and day out about uh, the impact of COVID on our lives. Um, one thing that we always say at the beginning of these is that we also recognize that there are thousands and thousands of people engaged in frontline emergency work and that they are doing the real hard slogging, making decisions, critical decisions, day and night uh, to keep people alive. And th these conversations are not about that. And we don't want to be in any way distracting from the efforts and the extraordinary challenges that those first frontline workers are facing and that our systems are encountering. Um, these conversations are about trying to make sense, trying to uh, look at things from a practical point of view, uh, looking specific at specifics in communities and sectors, and then trying to examine what are the immediate, uh, sort of shorter term over the next several months, and then longer term implications of what we're learning, and how we need to change, and what we're actually seeing. Um, we encourage you to use the chat function on this conversation, and uh, You'll see the chat boxes there and the four guests, their bios are, will be on there. Um, and uh, we have in the past had very rich conversations in these chat boxes. Uh, just be aware though that what you put up there stays up there, can't take something back. And uh, we also want to uh, archive all this material and post it subsequently. So we hope you'll take advantage of that. I will watch the chat function. Um, the panelists will be mostly focused on their own conversation, uh, but I'll be feeding into them what you're suggesting and talking about. And when you post on the chat, could you post to all? You'll see there's a choice. You can do it just to panelists, uh, but we'd appreciate you go to all so that everybody can see what's going on. And on Twitter, of course, if you wanna use Twitter, knock yourselves out, hashtag city talk. Uh, we're keen for this to be understood. This is the beginning of a conversation and it's gonna live on for a lot longer beyond just the hour we have together with these, these folks. So the focus today is on community wealth. And, uh, and I guess another way to ask that is, can what we're going through catalyze a more equitable uh, uh, community economy? And uh, these four that we've asked to come on are all in the trenches on this stuff, uh, thinking about this all the time. And so we're very pleased to have them take an hour to share with us what they're, they're uh, seeing and what their thoughts are. Uh, one of the other caveats I always offer is that people are here at, at, as individuals. Uh, they may work for uh, public sector entities, they may have clients that are public sector entities, or they may have employers uh, that, uh, for whom they have institutional uh, responsibility, but they're really here as individuals uh, offering for us uh, their insights and for us to have a, con a candid conversation about what people are seeing. Um, as you can see, we're recording this, and uh, previous uh, sessions that we've been having on City Talk are already uh, uh, posted, and this one will be too. So uh, people can come back and visit it, uh, and you can go back and see that comment that you missed. You can hear them say it again. Um, so uh, thanks for joining us, gang. Really glad to have you. Uh, we've got Ted Howard from Cleveland, the Democracy Collaborative, Colette Murphy from the Atkinson Foundation, Zita Cobb from Shorefast, and Rosemary Powell from the Toronto Community Benefits Network. Really happy to have you, gang. Uh, this is really a chance for you to have conversations with each other, and I just... Uh, uh, you know, try, as someone suggested in the pre-call, I'll, I'll try to make sure there isn't a bun fight. But if you know if there is a bun fight, it's, there's never, oh, it's never, a, never a bad time for a good bun fight, so have at it. But I'm going to start with you, Ted, uh, because you're our visitor. 
Uh, always happy to have a perspective from an American, and you're in Cleveland, uh, home of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And uh, I'm from London, Ontario, so I know Cleveland. Anybody from southwestern Ontario has a soft spot for Cleveland. And uh, uh, Ted, we know that you've been uh, you've been on this track for a while, thinking about how do we build economies for people. And so I'd be interested if we can just have a couple minutes from you, and then we're going to go around the room and hear a couple minutes from everybody about your initial observations of what you're seeing. Go ahead, Ted. Great. Thank you very much, Mary. Hi, everybody. As uh, Mary said, from Cleveland, Ohio, I'm in my apartment building. I'm looking north. I see Lake Erie. So we're on the southern shores of Lake Erie. Can't quite see Canada, but I know you're out there. Um, so I thought Mary's uh, initial question was really quite provocative. Can this current crisis catalyze a more equitable economy? And I believe the answer is yes, absolutely. If we uh, exert the power we have as historic actors to make that happen. Um, in my view, the status quo um, that we've known over the last 10, 20, 30 years, that status quo is gone. So it is not simply a question of getting back to status quo. It's what fork in the road are we going to take? One fork, and we can see it clearly here in the United States already, is that as our local economies are being decimated, uh, in the United States, for instance, uh, there are projections that 60% of all SMEs will be running out of cash in the next three months uh, unless something dramatic's done. And that means there's uh, an opportunity to, on the negative road that, if you will, um, to be rhetorical about it, vulture capital will come in and buy the local economy and concentrate it in a way it's never been concentrated. On the other hand, in this world turned upside down, community wealth building represents the fork in the road that can really lead to an advance of a way forward, a more democratic economy, more institutions and structures that are broadly held, broadly owned and locally rooted. In order to do that though, community wealth building, and this is a movement I've worked in now for 15 years or so, the collaborative, my organization is 20 years old. Uh, in my view, in order to seize the opportunity to rebuild our local economies in an inclusive democratic form that has broad local-based ownership and so forth, we need to move community wealth building from uh, a kind of the fringes of local experimentation and interesting individual models. And we need to really build a movement so that, that this frame of economic development that is very different than, than subsidies to large corporations and trickle down and so forth, that the community wealth frame becomes the accepted norm for local economic development, reconstruction and recovery. So it's not simply model building, it's the question before us, the historic question is, can we supplant the current economic development paradigm? And I believe that's the case. Um, one of the great leverage opportunities, certainly here in the United States, is that huge resources are being appropriated by our federal government in the US through quantitative easing. You've probably seen $2.2 trillion for the recovery. Um, we're talking about another two trillion dollars or more and a lot of this money of course is going to flow to big corporations But a lot is going to come down to municipalities and local authorities That money along with existing uh, Resources locally that are used for local business support services and all that there needs to be a serious political engagement and even struggle over how are these resources going to be appropriated in the coming years because this is a long-term rebuilding of the economy and we need to capture that money and not let it evaporate into the hands of, of concentrated corporate wealth finally at the collaborative we when we start articulating the community wealth frame uh, 15 years ago we identified eight principles of community wealth building and perhaps on this call we can discuss some of that but you know one of them is the labor ma matters more than capital um, so the capital is important, but the interest of working people and decent labor and work is very important. So as we recover our economies, we need to use the principles of community wealth building to preserve jobs, resist calls for austerity, cuts to public sector employment and so forth, and bring people back to regularize full employment 
hopefully where they have an ownership stake in that job rather than expand the gig economy and precarious work even further. And there are many other such examples. Um, a final thing I'd say, Mary, is um, for those of you of interest, uh, in uh, next week, the Democracy Collaborative and Partners in the United Kingdom, called the Center for Local Economic Strategies, is issuing a new paper uh, called um, Owning the Future After Coronavirus, A New Era of Community Wealth Building. Uh, that paper will be up on our Democracy Collaborative Org website in about a week, maybe 10 days. Uh, you're encouraged to come uh, download that to see specifics of st strategies for building com community wealth in this new economic phase we're in. That's great. And um, Ted, thanks. Before I go to the next person, a couple of just uh, uh, logistics uh, uh, sort of mechanics here. First, I should have mentioned to folks, if you want to volunteer with CUI and help us populate these sites, we need volunteers. Please email us at covidresponse at canherb.org. Uh, we'd be delighted. We need more city watchers, more city sharers. We already have hundreds. We need more. So please, if you've got bandwidth to give us an hour a day, that'd be great. Second thing is on the chat, I misspoke. Uh, when you chat, you need to toggle your switch to all panelists and attendees. Because otherwise, only the panelists get to see your brilliant things here. And it'd be great if you can switch to including everybody so everybody can see what you're asking and promoting. Third thing, Ted's just started the trend and this happened before in a previous one as well. When people, when our panelists start to refer to reports or bo books or things we should read, uh, we will post those. So, uh, so we'll get the, you can repeat them panelists as you need to, but we'll make sure they go on the chat function and we will post them so people can find resources like that. Ted, you got us off to a great start. Thanks. Let's go to Colette in Toronto at the Atkinson Foundation. Thanks, Mary. Uh, really great to be here with everyone. I see some familiar faces and names in the chat boxes. Um, Mary, in the first month of the crisis, we've been seeing organizers in low-income communities do what they do best amplify the voices of people who are most affected by this crisis and keeping them connected to each other. And I wanna go right down to a granular level to paint a picture. So take Parkdale, uh, one of the last remaining affordable neighborhoods in downtown Toronto. Most in South Parkdale are renters, 35% live in poverty, Main Street is home to many small businesses. The community is anchored at both ends by large healthcare facilities. Parkdale's been through a lot, and I'm gonna give this context for those who are not from the city, from the building of the Gardner Expressway in the 1960s to the uh, institutionalization in the 70s to enormous gentrification pressures in the 2000s. This has created a high degree of resiliency and social capital. This neighborhood is surprisingly vibrant in good times and in bad, and how residents look out for each other and share resources is really remarkable. In recent years, community wealth building activities have been a high priority for organizers in the Parkdale Activity Recreation Center. They work with residents, community agencies, and small businesses through the Parkdale People's Economy. They have this exciting vision that Ted was starting to paint for economic development of their community that's centered on well-being. In contrast to the increasing displacement pressures from the rise of corporate landowners, escalating rent, poor work conditions, and other challenges. Over 800 residents have been involved in this effort in recent years, and historically and persistently excluded residents have been at the center. They're focused on building collective power to influence decisions of all kinds, from the creation of community land trusts to affordable housing from existing and new stock. So when COVID-19 arrived, organizers Mercedes Sharzeas and Ana Teresa Portillo were able to pivot to emergency response activities. They have built sufficient community knowledge, networks, and trust to really move very quickly. Along with many others, they created the Parkdale Mutual Aid Network. It, right in, right in, like smack in early March, it's a network of neighborhood pods organized block by block. Neighbors check in on neighbors, pooling resources to help each other, providing food hampers, giving small sums of money, and fighting evictions, as well as reducing isolation and mental health. And they use digital tools like WhatsApp and phone trees to stay connected. While organizers have put down some of their community wealth building tools to attend to more immediate needs, their vision and core values, I think, remain very strong. 
and the tools that and muscles that have been developed will be used in the social and economic renewal process after the pandemic. And maybe just like two other quick observations. The crisis has reminded us at the foundation that strong relationships are the most important asset of all. They're key to community resilience and they make commu a community wealthy even when resources are scarce. Um, and we see this kind of social solidarity in other neighborhoods and cities across the country. Crisis and hardships have always had the potential to build capacity and renew community leadership. And question I think it's hot pursuiting Ted from earlier is how do we build um, and cultivate this kind of organizing culture in more places during the pandemic so that we can transition to a different type of economy uh, when we're through this. Thanks, Colette. Uh, the, the cultivating and organizing structure is interesting. So uh, the Parkdale People's Economy and the various examples that Colette's referring to are up on citysharecanada.ca. You can search for them. And uh, Parkdale was early uh, with this kind of social networking, uh, care mongering system. And there are others across, there's, there are similar kinds of initiatives in Edmonton neighborhoods and Vancouver neighborhoods. I'm sure there are in Cleveland. And, uh, it, but thank you for taking us right down to the granular. So let's uh, go now to uh, Rosemary to talk because she just gave you the lead in there about community organizing, Rosemary. So over to you to talk a little bit about uh, what you've been seeing and observing and then we'll finish up with Zita and then we'll have the open call. Go ahead, Rosemary. Thanks. Uh, well, like Colin said, uh, you know, Toronto has been uh, a thriving city uh, before COVID. Um, you know, a lot of it uh, fueled by, uh, by infrastructure and urban development uh, projects where the government of Canada uh, the province, the local uh, municipality uh, has been investing billions and billions of hundreds of billions of dollars uh, in infrastructure. And, uh, you know, despite that, we've continued to see rising inequality and a real uh, distancing of, uh, you know, uh, people uh, based on um, their uh, you know, situations that they can't control. So, uh, you know, based on um, race, based on neighborhood that they live in, based on, um, you know, length of time in Canada, all sorts of, uh, you know, issues that local communities have been dealing with uh, for many, many years. Now, COVID has just basically come and uh, put a monkey wrench uh, in, in all of this. So the same kinds of issues and inequalities that we were seeing at the time, during the time when Toronto uh, was thriving, um, we're seeing this, um, you know, it just blown up um, during this crisis. On the ground, we are seeing that, uh, for us, uh, we've basically, we've built, uh, we've, we've, we've built an organization, uh, the Toronto Community Benefits Network, which is really, which really catalyzed work that had been happening for many, many years uh, in the city and across, uh, you know, Canada uh, for community benefits. You know, looking at whenever there's a major infrastructure project is built, how do we make sure um, that we address the issues of inequality in our local communities and, you know, creating jobs and opportunities um, from those projects? And so, uh, you know, we've been making some inroads since the last uh, five years that we've started, developed a number of uh, community benefits agreements, uh, uh, you know, here in Toronto, um, you know, seen the movement uh, expand across, uh, across Canada. And so we have some projects and we had some outcomes that, uh, that we were, you know, finally uh, starting to see from these projects. And basically now um, people are actually seeing that those opportunities that they had have been totally decimated. So people are no longer, uh, you know, working. Um, and we know that whenever there is a major, uh, you know, uh, you know, problem like a recession or, you know, a pandemic like this, people from underrepresented communities uh, often end up being uh, the last to be rehired. Um, and during the, the situation, uh, they're the ones who are experiencing the, the, the biggest pain from this underrepresented groups uh, we've seen. So, um, you know, historically uh, disadvantaged communities, they are the same people who are now being considered um, as the, uh, the heroes um, during this pandemic, right? So uh, they're the ones who were working the minimum wage uh, jobs, uh, you, you know, where, you know, as uh, uh, grocery store workers, uh, you know, Uber drivers, uh, um, you know, retail, um, 
uh, you know, workers, personal support workers, healthcare workers, really people who's been, uh, you know, basically the first line of, resp of responders, and but who at the same time were making, uh, you know, really uh, low wage and working in precarious jobs. Now they don't have the opportunity th during this crisis um, to be able to stay home and to physically distance. Uh, from others. They, they're essential workers, they got to get back out there and they have to work and, uh, you know, they have to use the public, um, you know, transit. Uh, you know, they live in homes, um, you know, with large families. They don't have two or three bathrooms where if somebody uh, gets ill, they can actually, um, you know, stay away from them within the same household. Um, you know, we've had the luxury as an organization to be able to retain all of our staff and to be able to move uh, to a work at home situation. Um, but um, yeah, <laughs> not everybody actually has that. And even for those who are able to, to, to work at home, depending on, uh, you know, your situation, you might not be able to uh, be able to connect, um, you know, by internet, um, you know, to con connect online to be able to do this work or have the kind of home situation that would allow you Right. Uh, to be able to, um, uh, you know, to, to be able to continue to participate um, in the economy. And you have additional responsibilities. You have responsibilities oftentimes uh, for communities of color. We have not just responsibilities here at home, but this is a worldwide uh, pandemic. And so they have responsibilities back home in their countries of origin, um, you know, where they have to be looking out for grandparents or uncles or sisters who are left back. And so not being able to, you know, to support, um, you know, j just uh, there is going to be, there's going to be a huge mental health crisis um, that is going to be uh, coming out of this by the time COVID is over on top of the economic yeah. crisis that we're seeing. And, you know, quite frankly, um, we know that infrastructure is going to drive uh, the recovery. And so, uh, you know, the concept of community benefits that we have been, you know, you know, working towards uh, building, uh, you know, I think is going to be, um, you know, that um, a tool or process that is going to be able to, if, if, if we're able to double down on that going forward, um, we are going to be able to have a different kind, uh, you know, of society when we get out of this, but failing to do that, um, and to be able to consider the benefits uh, for the community, for people who have been underrepresented, historically disadvantaged and equity seeking groups, um, we are going to, um, you know, to really run the risk, uh, you, know, of, uh, you know, of a society that uh, is not going to be tenable for most people to live and what will happen. Yeah, I, I want to come back to the whether or not community benefits agreements approaches are the antidote to vulture capitalism that Ted mentioned. But uh, I'm going to go to you next, Ida. But um, just for Ted's benefit, just so you know, Toronto was in the, was in the midst of a huge boom. More more cranes in the sky than any. I think I think they were saying more cranes in the sky than Beijing. Then they stopped saying that. But um, uh, but it, it's and it and because of Colette and and Rosemary's advocacy, they were able to wrench in a lot of local jobs out of that. And we're getting questions in the chat about well, are those infrastructure projects going to go forward and how will they be approved and what is that going to look like, et cetera, et cetera. So before we get, well, I'll circle back on a number of things people are saying, but Zita, I just want to hear from you. And Shorefest, I see on the chat, we've got people uh, watching from the Change <laughs> Islands and from hey. different parts of Newfoundland. So, uh, and I know we're the Canadian Urban Institute, but we talk all the time about place and the quality of place and uh, believe strongly that uh, place is a thing that matters to people, whether you live in a community of uh, 2,600 like Fogo Island or uh, two and a half million like Toronto. So uh, give us perspective in terms of Shorefest and what you've been seeing and observing. Okay, and for people who are not from Change Islands who might be listening in, uh, Ogo Island, which is where our projects are, Shorefest project is on the Northeast coast of Newfoundland. Um, and listening to all of you speaking, it's an interesting contrast between remote small community, island community and Parkdale. I don't think we could find within Canada two more different places However, we're actually struggling to do the same thing. I always loved yeah. that line from Chicken Run. Remember the movie where the, the uh, humans started to realize that the chickens were organizing. So Mary, thank you for helping organize. Um, I, I think the fundamental question that you asked was how can we build community wealth as our economies recover? And so I come at this uh, from a very different way because I come at it from kind of a financial way of thinking about it. 
well, the first question is, we all throw around the word community, you know, and, and every time we say community, I feel people who may have come from the corporate world thinking, oh, how sweet. And so I think we have a lot of work to do, us chickens, to help people understand what the heck we mean when we mean community. And it's not just tea on Thursdays. And I think that the thing we're trying to figure out how to do in our different ways and coming from different places of experience is how do we make the economy community centric? We, we can't take care of every person one at a time, but communities can take care of people once you can divide the economy up to be to the community. So what we're talking about, whether we're talking about venture capitalism or vulture capitalism and the things Rosemary's talking about is a whole bunch of economic activity goes on that on a good day is agnostic to community and on a bad day is actually downright hostile. So that needs to change. And we, I think we've been trying to patch up the holes. And I really think this is not a pause. This is a reset. If, yeah. And it depends on what we do. And yeah. so I think about it this way. I, I first saw Chris was thinking, what does wealth mean? Well, I want to leave that to a whole bunch of people, like starting with Maslow. Wealth has to do with well-being and, and all the ways we can define it. What is interesting, um, I think, way to approach this is what are the drivers of wealth? And how do we use those drivers in communities where there's agency in communities? So if we talk, I'm not on Fogo Island today because I got waylaid in Ottawa on my way home and now Air Canada doesn't fly to Gander anymore. So it's an, I can't even think about how to get home. Um, but if you look at Fogo Island today, and, and of course I'm in touch all the time and I know some of my colleagues are on the call, we are um, a, a remote small community of 2,500 people. Some of the concerns around being fed or being cared for they, the, that community is intact, has always been able to take care, and we're just organized that way. Um, we are also, Fogo Island, uh, the, the, probably a the, the hotbed of community ownership because our economy, which is based on fishery and, and tourism, all of the economic assets are actually owned by the community. The fishery is owned by a cooperative and the opinion is owned by a charitable organization that the beneficial owners are the community. So you would think that it's all peaches and roses, wouldn't you think? Because we got the levers. Like I don't have to deal with a you know a freaking developer that's going to you know, tear down something or or throw people out of their homes. So we actually have our hands on the levers, which really makes me think about what are the drivers of wealth. Number one is for us access to to financial capital because for all of you people that are in Toronto and maybe is in Cleveland too, um, Ted, you, do you, like you can reach out and talk to people who have money. The more remote you are, uh, the, there's some algorithm somewhere in Toronto that decides who gets a loan. Believe me, no one on Fogo Island decides these things. So for the smaller communities that are remote, but it doesn't matter where you are, you've heard, you could be doing a deeply, you know, urban community project in Toronto and still not have a financial capital. So, that is one big driver. The other big driver, which I think is huge, and I, and in different ways, I hear us all say the same thing. It's our ability at the community level to conspire and to collaborate and to create, because we don't have the architectures to work at the levers of the economy. And we don't collaborate well, and too often what happens is, you know, we think that tensions make us incompatible. And... And I think it's finding these right architectures. One of the things we've created on Fogo Island, and it's new, it's probably the most important thing that we're doing right now is we created what we call an economic development partnership, which brings together the municipality. And, you know, in Rajan's book, you know, the, it's talking about the three pillars, he puts municipalities as a part of community, which they very much are not a part of government, three other two pillars, government and business. And so this economic development partnership brings together the two, the two big economic actors on Fogo Island and the municipality together. It's the first time we've done that in 400 years. And so, that, but that is such an essential thing. And then the third one is our ability to measure flows. Uh, you can look at all of the human systems, whether you're talking about food or health or education and attached to every one of those systems. And there are a lot of systems thinkers that design all kinds of systems that don't put communities in the design at all. But every one of those systems throws off economic activity and every one of those systems has a lot of levers that communities don't have their hands on. And so understanding who's got their hands on the levers, being able to measure that and measure every dollar that comes in and out of whether it's Parkdale, 
and you know we're talking about community benefit agreements we have to wrangle with big companies and and i hope ted's not right and they're going to this is going to be a moment where they get bigger and if we're going to wrangle with them if you are in our community how how are we going to uh expect and demand that you behave and now let's follow the money um, absolutely yeah. i think that was too long but yeah no that's fine no no, no so, that's good let's uh, let's open it up now i just i'll start by just talking about asking a question of, about the vulture capital looming uh risk so and levers i guess why don't i take the beginning and the end the two that you just uh, that both of you just touched on do you think we can get access to these levers you know it, fogo island is 2600 people but in many ways it's a little microcosm of parkdale it's not as diverse has a whole bunch of different constraints but it's still local organizing and a local unit that you can kind of wrap your arms around um can I, ted do you want to just come back in and just comment a bit more about how serious you think the vulture capital risk is that we're all going to out and well i think it's very i think it's extremely um uh it's a ser very serious risk i mean as we're thinking of this at the collaborative as you know the the possibilities for the future are the good the bad and the ugly and the bad is a kind of reversion to the way we've had the economy but with absolutely more concentration um you know there are going to be so many things companies in this in the united states at least that are really kind of on the chopping block you know that they've been now so devalued economically that you could come up with a lot of money and just come in and scoop them up so we could which find was, which was already happening in housing you know the financialization of housing was already happening so exactly and the financialization of the whole economy could really go off on steroids so that you really have a local economy that's dominated by you know walmart's and tgi fridays and amazon and and i know it's it may sound bizarre but it absolutely could happen the ugly is I mean, that's the bad. The ugly is the, the state could really step into a kind of state capitalism sort of situation. It could become actually quite authoritarian. You only need to listen to our president's daily two-hour rants uh, on television in the United States to see where certain forces are like to take this economy. So this organize, I'm glad the, the term organizing has come up here because this is a major organizing challenge. We have got to organize in our communities. Again, to get beyond nice one-off projects, we need sort of multiracial and multi-stakeholder collaboratives within our communities that can really push back across against this trend and build out this positive future. I mean, we've got a lot of history and evidence on our side. Employee-owned companies across the board are generally better than investor-owned companies on all kinds of metrics, whether it's the wages, the, the experience of the job, the productivity of the company, the fact they don't lay off workers at nearly at the same level as investor-owned companies during times of crisis. So we have the evidence we need to build the local politics around that. And if we don't, I think this is the opportunity where, at least in the United States and in places like the UK, I can't talk about Canada, where the acceleration of concentration in the economy in local communities could be absolutely extraordinary. And I just want to add to Ted what you just said in the Canadian context, and I think this is an accurate um, number, something like 70% of the SMEs, small, medium-sized enterprises in Canada, 70% are going to change hands in the next 10 years. And we know that demographic data. And so I'll give you an example from Fogo Island, which is we have two or three businesses on the island that have been in, in owners' hands, local people's hands for you know forever. And they need to, you know, they're at an age they want to sell. And we are struggling as a community to get access to financial capital to enable other local players to buy those businesses. And that is a full-time job in itself. If, and the alternative is not pretty because the alternatives are either they'll close, which is devastating to the community, because goodness, you may have to go to Gander to get a nail. And, or where you're going with this is to say some you know, money that's looking for a return, and there's an awful lot of money looking for a return, it would just be owned, and we see this in our fishery with this concentration of fishing licenses that, that, increasingly is not attached to the community 
based fishery that we've come from. So problem, I think that's threat number one. So, you know, we're on the chat box, we're getting lots of activity on this, guys, about then if, if we need access to said levers and if traditional capital tends to go in a different direction, what are the antidotes to that? So what are the tools that we can put in place? Community organizing is one. What else? Colette and Rosemary, talk to us about it. I mean, there are alternate finance systems. There are schemes where people are trying to get money in the hands of people to be able to own these businesses differently. Colette and Rosemary, do you want to weigh in on that? Sure. Um, okay. Okay, so first, I mean, I think what's so fascinating uh, in being laid bare in this uh, crisis is that we're learning about, about our local economies in very profound ways by, you know, our main streets being shuttered and the global economy because who's delivering things to our front door? It's Amazon's and how inequitable the resources are that are being distributed, just to put a fine point on um, what Zita and Ted are saying. I think one really interesting thing we can think about um, that I'll throw in is the role of the state. Um, you know, in a very big way in, in the last um, financial crisis, money was lent or, or in fact and often given um, to companies to bail them out, to stabilize them, to get them through. Um, and then in places like a neighborhood near ours, the town of Oshawa, when the going got good, uh, GM and it financially stabilized, packed up and went south looking for uh, cheaper labor, <laughs> um, looser, uh, decent work standards. And so, you know, as we think about this, it part of um, what we have to push and um, make uh, uh, evident our expectation to our political leaders that if the state is going to step in, that they take an ownership state. So we don't socialize the risk and then privatize the returns when things get better. So I think that's a lever that, you know, what would have happened if GM, uh, the government of Canada or the province of Ontario had a 30% ownership stake in, in what they invested in here. And then GM said, hey, we, we're, we're going good now, we're going somewhere else. So this idea of, um, how governments use capital, um, you know, and can we build a uh, stabilization fund so that uh, our housing doesn't fall into the hands of large corporate owners. And you're sort of different under a different kind of covenant somehow. You're, you're wanting yeah. some kind of a different deal. I mean, Zita was, in, it was hinting on this too, you want a different deal. Rosemary, your whole piece has been about getting a different deal in large infrastructure projects, right? Yes, and the tool that we've been using under the umbrella of Community Benefits Agreement is all about social procurement. Right. So looking at uh, how do we ensure that these large uh, multinational, multi-billion dollar companies um, are actually um, carving out opportunities for uh, local businesses, for diverse owned businesses and for social enterprises. We have a lot of talent in our local communities and people who are innovative and who want to contribute um, to the economy and who are developing uh, businesses and who just needs the opportunity, um, you know, for contracts to be able to scale. We're not asking for a hand out, we're asking for a hand up. And as community, we, uh, you know, are organizing using that uh, framework of uh, community benefits agreement to demand social procurement. So um, ensuring that the contractors are actually breaking down their contracts and, um, you know, uh, and, and that uh, these uh, small companies and diverse owned businesses have, an, have, have a real chance to be able to compete um, uh, uh, for the contracts and they might need to do things, um, you know, differently uh, to be able to achieve this social procurement goal. But that's okay because when we look at it, the benefits far outweigh um, the, um, the status quo. Um, and so, um, you know, th those are the kinds of things that we need to look at. Not only that, when infrastructure projects are being built, um, we need to make sure that there are, um, you know, carve outs for those businesses, those mom and pop shops um, that have been really kind of holding space in those local communities and have been the engine of those communities. Oftentimes what happens is that these big box stores 
stores, uh, you know, they get the ability to come in or these, uh, you know, franchises, like, you know, why does there need to be, you know, uh, 10 Tim Hortons, um, you know, uh, coffee shops in the area? What about those mom and pop shops? So making sure that we retain retail space uh, for those existing businesses in the local neighborhoods. I'll give you the, the, um, the issue that we're dealing with right here uh, with the Eglinton Crosstown project, which is, uh, you know, an eight uh, plus uh, billion dollar um, project. Uh, so they built, the, they're building transit along uh, the neighborhood improvement areas and along a strip called Little Jamaica. Now, Little Jamaica has existed for um, you know, for, for, for many, many years, and it's been a vibrant, uh, vibrant, um, you know, uh, small business area along that strip. Um, you know, very much uh, culturally specific where you have, uh, you know, small stores, hairdressing, um, you know, um, you know, uh, restaurants, uh, you know, you know, shops that serves, um, you know, that local community and especially that particular community, but also the whole um, of the city. And they, during the you know regular times, they were being decimated by the actual construction bill that was happening during uh, those five years. With COVID, they're devastated. They're finished. Restaurants are not working anymore. So you know, how are we making sure that when we're building infrastructure, that we're actually carve, we're thinking ahead about the how politics. it's going to impact exactly and yeah. coming up with solutions uh, with the people who are being impacted to be able to address it and that we actually keep in mind that those people want to be able to remain in their communities and they have value and asset that they can actually contribute if you give them a chance to be able to do that and they will be the future and the engine of that economy when the builders uh, you know move out of the area. So can I get a sense from you as a group um, you know, this question about what role should the state have? What role do we have for rules? Uh, in the United States, uh, on the chat box, lots of people are asking, well, do we need a Community Reinvestment Act the way that the U.S. has, uh, historically had? Um, and they've struggled with that, obviously. But do you, what, what do people imagine in the Canadian context, Ted, I'm just going to ask the, the Canadian gang to think about this for a sec. You know, how interventionist do you want the state to be? Do you think that for instance, local retail, um, Rosemary, should we be seeing more involvement with the municipal government, for instance, in terms of how main streets are used and how those businesses are, that, that's about money, you know, that's the dilemma, that's about money, how do you pay for it? What other tools do we have, I guess, to intervene to get control of these levers? Zita, you started this, I'm gonna pass it back to you. Okay, well, I think we should all read Rajan's book. The yeah, three can you just, just repeat the name of the book, they'll put it up on the chat. The three, the three Pillars. The three uh, really being government, business, and community. And I want to make my earlier point again that I think we need, we have still a lot of work to do to uh, have a broader and deeper understanding that's shared. But what can we mean by community? And it's not all about fellowing each other or whatever the Queen called it, because sometimes we don't fellow each other, but we still have to cooperate within a community. So it's getting communities to grow. First of all, like a coherent will and arms and legs to actually participate as as economic actors in their own physical places people live. I think that we have to build that architecture. We also have to build the architecture because how often do I hear governments say, quite a lot actually, especially the national government, we'd like to do more in communities, but like how do you work with communities? It's this amorphous thing. And how do you know what they think? You have to go to the grocery store and interview 10 people? Like, what is a freaking community? Because it's not just the municipality. That's an part of it. It's not the only part. The other thing is we don't have the architecture for money to flow from big pockets to small pockets. And certainly we don't have the architecture. Well, we have architecture. It just doesn't distribute it very much, right? Well, yeah, I mean, well. to people who are controlling massive amounts of money in Toronto, for example, and they'll say, well, that's kind of too small for us. Too and small. Well, and who would I lend it to? And how do I know I'm going to get it back? And who's managing it? And many, many communities are not, we're not organized. It's back to, we need those, we need to grow the architecture for yeah. that. And back to the chicken yeah. run. But, but so do we, so do, we need, do we need new tools? Like, do we need new mechanisms? We need to develop, for example, one of the things that we're working on creating uh, is something we work on a community finance fund. And I think there are different examples of those in the world. But if we could put forward a coherent, thing that has a governance structure that, I mean, first of all, every citizen needs to know more about these levers of business. That's a whole other question. But what, if we had community finance funds that are, where decisions are made in the local about how they're distributed or not distributed, 
where there's coherent professional reporting back to the investors, I think we would spend a lot less time complaining and a lot more time managing money, which we as communities have to get better organized to do. Uh, so we need that architecture. And I still think we're missing the fundamental architecture to collaborate effectively uh, across these three pillars that Rajan talks about. I mean, where do, do communities, business, and government sit down and have this conversation we are having today? Mary, that's the next one you have to do. Okay, well, well, I think, I mean, I do think as you suggest, COVID has pushed us into that place where we have to have that conversation because we're in it together, right? Colette, do you want to jump in? I do. I mean, I, so amidst uh, this deep crisis and, you know, anybody who says, well, here's the prognosis, uh, what, what I see on the other side, like, we don't know what it's going to look like when we move through this. We know it's not going to be good. Um, that is for sure. Um, and so um, in this moment, though, I'm seeing enormously promising collaboration amongst policy thinkers, organizers, with governments in real time. In less than four weeks, we have built the CERB, the, Ted, yeah. it's called the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, um, getting cash into people's pockets in two to three days. We've, re we've like started to re-knit holes in a safety net. Now, it is not perfect yet, but every week there are people putting their hands up and saying, hey, you know what? You've missed social assistance recipients who are doing some work. Are you going to claw that back? What about undocumented workers? What about people who are in the gig economy that don't want to give up all of their um, income, um, which the rules when they were originally written said you had to have about three months. In a real time, we are rewriting a set of rules, policies. So I think it's a muscle that we're starting to exercise in a different way, in part because of a catastrophe and a crisis. But I think the opportunity is for us as we begin to see what is possible, what government can do and the role of the state stepping in to play an appropriate role during this type of a crisis. The question is, what are the other tools and mechanisms they need to put in place to support communities in the kinds of ways we've been talking, to build more solidarity, more equity, uh, sustainability and sufficiency for everybody. And I think that is um, what we're seeing happening very quickly. The spring back, that, that, that elastic band mechanism, you know, you stretch it the minute we start to move into the other side of things, uh, this notion that, you know, recovery is getting back to business as usual, but I think most of us don't want to see that. We actually want to get to a new normal. There is a worry that we'll regress to the mean, right? Yeah. yeah and what, I, what I would suggest and implore too is that the government actually um, make sure that they're targeting um, the resources. Not everybody experiences this COVID crisis um, the same way. And some people are more impacted than others. And Canada refuses um, Ontario refuses to really look at a race-based um, um, data to be able to make uh, decisions, to be able to target supports to the people who are experiencing uh, challenges the most. We've seen from the United States where in some communities, um, you know, black communities and uh, people of color and uh, um, Hispanic are actually, um, uh, you know, three times, um, you know, dying um, from this COVID than others. Wouldn't it make sense that we actually understand this information and, and track it and making sure that we are actually targeting the resources to yeah. those people who are suffering the most? Yeah, I mean, somebody was saying COVID-19 is the great equalizer, but that's so wrong. Yeah, mm -hmm. so wrong. It's disproportionately Absolutely. affecting people. And, and even we get it in, uh, in our discourse, you know, where people are talking about, oh, we've got to make sure that we protect density. Density is good. Well, density is actually the pits for a lot of people. Uh, there are people where <laughs> living in circumstances where density has made their lives. It's been bad density. It's not been well supported. It's not been well designed. So uh, we have to kind of move from that. All right. I want to just, we want to get another uh, couple of rounds for each of you. And I'm, I'm interested in sort of the fundamentals of what we think uh, the, the, the key interventions should be. Uh, as Colette suggested, there, there's been remarkable, I mean, the window is open 
everybody is listening. People are saying, how can we, how do we? And every week they have to adjust it. The, the uh, support to small business, for instance, has been seen as woefully inadequate because all it really did was push people into more debt. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't have cash flows in the first place, what are you gonna have your workers mm -hmm. do even if you keep them on? So there are fundamental questions that we haven't been able to resolve. But can we imagine what the sort of systemic intervention could be? CERB is one. Yeah, I, I, I think we are still we, missing, we are, so we are missing the, the right architecture to carry on what we have done out of individual heroics over these past weeks. And I, I mean, colleague, right. you're absolutely right. It's incredible what's gotten done. But unless and until we formalize these kinds of conversations on platforms or in architectures that they're going to carry on, then those conversations will stop. And that what does that mean in terms of making different architectures? So who who got in those conversations that Colette you're describing to come up with that program so quickly? And what is the body then that we can create that brings government, communities, and business, the three pillars, together in those kinds of conversations? The first shift that has to happen. And if if we miss this opportunity, shame on all of us. Uh, the shift that has to happen is from an economy that is made up of companies, the sum of that makes the economy, to an economy that's made up of communities. And so just that's the first shift in understanding. And I mean, I can look at a, a simple example on Fogo Island of the things that are, are structural things we have to change. In our, in our little islands of 2,500 people, we shockingly have a housing crisis. Why do we have a housing crisis? Well, it's a long, complicated story, but we are also not uh, immune at all to what's gone on with Airbnb. And, you know, people from far away buying houses that, that for reasons that have nothing to do with community well-being. And so when we talk and we talk with our mayor about we got to do something about getting more houses built, he has to go and get approval from the province in St. John's, which could take a very long time. So I think it's like, let us just take the moment to, we're talking to governments, we're talking to businesses, but we have to devolve into the locals, into the community level around decision-making, around economic decisions like that I just described. And what are the architectures that we can codify coming out of this that are gonna ensure these conversations carry on? Okay, so can we disaggregate to the local? I mean, we are, we, this is something that a lot of urbanists have been concerned about. Can we get more resources and more autonomy and power to cities? Can you do the same for capital? Can, Ted, can we, can, what do you think about this? Can we actually drive capital to the local and have it stay there instead of being sent back? And the same pattern that Zita's explaining where she has to ask permission to make something happen in terms of a, a municipal decision, which we think should be vested locally. Can we do the same with money? Can money be aggregated locally? It absolutely can be, but <clears throat> I think we need to understand all the different types of capital. There's this sort of Wall Street investment capital. Um, you know, that's not gonna be what we need in this case. We need to be looking at new sources of capital, for instance, public banks. In the United States, we have one public bank, the Bank in North Dakota, which has a very good record of economic stabilization in that state for the last 100 years. California now, last year, passed a, uh, a kind of pilot, 10-year pilot project to be in public banking there. But imagine if our cities and our authorities and our states instead of putting all of their resources into the big five or six large banks that every country is dominated by, here in Cleveland, imagine we had the Bank of Cleveland capitalized by the reserves of the city of Cleveland with a policy of local investment. So public banking, which is a huge movement in the United States, is a very important part of the new capital stack here. The second thing is, I mentioned before, with again, at least in the US, the trillions of dollars that are being created by the federal government through quantitative easing, where money is literally being created out of nothing, um, that money is going to come down to communities eventually, a lot of it. A lot of it's going to get eaten up by the large corporate actors, but money's coming down to the communities and that money needs to be captured. That's a big source of capital that could be invested Colette also mentioned that our governments, in order to stabilize the larger industries, like the airline industry, are going to be providing tens and tens, hundreds of billions of dollars to industry. Um, she asked the question, why don't we take an equity stake? And that's exactly right. This, 
This used to be a radical idea. I was reading yesterday in the news in the US, Mark Cuban, one of the largest billionaires in this country, said, yes, if the government needs to invest, it needs to bail out the airline industry, fine, but we should, the government should take an equity stake on behalf of the people of the country. That used to be a radical notion. Now it's becoming more common sense. We're leading a campaign in the US called buyouts, not bailouts. Mm. So there are different sources of capital. And the final one I point to actually is um, uh, our large institutions, like our universities, have very large endowments and investment portfolios. Those need to be refocused. And we've been working on this for a long time at the Democracy Collaborative. Our anchor institutions, their endowments need to be, investment portfolios need to be put on the main street in our communities. It's a huge source of capital. In the US, it's well over a trillion dollars. So capital is absolutely essential, but the sources are right in front of us. We need to organize to make this a, a top priority that we focus it in this way. And last thing I'd say is in the United States, there's been a lot of talk about the Green New Deal, where it's moving now because of the crisis, and we're doing a lot of work on this, is a green stimulus program. And that is another source of capital that could be married very well to the community wealth building frame. I, I just want to add to this, Mary. Mary, in the Canadian context, I want to add to what Ted said is super important. This country has some of the biggest pension funds on the planet. Those pension funds need to come home and invest. And we as Canadians need to be a little more open-minded instead of holding them to 8% and totally unrealistic returns. We need to understand if we want money to come to our communities, we need to be a little more reasonable. And, and Ted, I wouldn't give up on investment capital from Wall Street. They have to come home too. Everybody's got to come home. Uh, Colette and then Rosemary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Hot Pursuit, I um, completely agree with my colleagues. I think it's where the tool of shareholder activism, um, you know, takes on a new urgency as well to hold those companies accountable that we do have in our pension portfolios, et cetera, and expect more from them. Um, I completely agree with Ted that, um, and others that we have to have government use the money it is spending, you know, whether it's through infrastructure spending, through procurement, through the kind of uh, taking equity state moving over. We should have that expectation. This is our money. So we shouldn't be socializing the risks and privatizing the returns as we move through this. And finally, I think I would say, I really want to go back um, to, I think, I, the most creative, ingenious, imaginative uh, solutions have come from people who have always worked on the economic margins. And that if they're going to lead community uh, imagination and leadership to help us figure our way out of this. And it's through building social solidarity and trust, taking our cues from them. And then, of course, building out and um, collaborating with all sectors. But that trust, that social solidarity has to be there. Otherwise, we do risk turning in on ourselves um, and moving to that survival of the fittest mode as opposed to this notion that we only will all survive if we all do well. Rosemary. Yes, just building on what uh, Khalid is saying, uh, you know, we need a strong, vibrant, well-resourced community services sector. Uh, during this crisis and prior, um, these uh, community organizations, um, you know, have been doing heroic efforts to be able to support, um, you know, the most vulnerable among us. And yet the government consistently um, underfund um, these, uh, these organizations. Um, another challenge that we're seeing at the local level is that there are some organizations who support particular communities, um, especially well because of the, um, you know, the direct um, connectedness uh, that they have with them. And so I'm talking about, for example, black community organizations who, uh, you know, for whatever reason, 
they're doing all the work on the ground, but they're not getting the kinds of financial supports that they need. The larger organizations, um, you know, are, you know, being preferred in terms of, uh, you know, intermediaries um, into, um, you know, transferring, uh, you know, monies and supports into the local communities. And that's really unfortunate because there are sometimes very culturally specific types of supports, um, you know, that needs to happen and that there are organizations and, uh, you know, these social services uh, groups who are doing absolutely incredible work and who don't have the resources to be able to do it. Um, on the ground with TCBN, what we're doing right now, uh, you know, just as a, a local organization is, uh, you know, so, you know, staff is working from home for sure, but, and we know that our people has been, you know, devastated um, by, uh, by COVID. Some of them are working still because construction still remains um, an essential service, but the non-construction work uh, that we've negotiated, uh, most of that has stopped. But also the training centers, lots of people were in the pipeline, actually hoping to have an opportunity once things starts to open up uh, on these construction projects. And now everything's basically shut down. There is no training that's happening. They can't get their certificates. And basically they're in a state of, um, you know, of pause. So what can they do during this time to actually take advantage of the moment so that they can prepare themselves to be able to get back into the job market once things are going? We know that people from underrepresented groups are always the last to be called back um, after, um, after a recession, after uh, you know, a, a situation like this. And so how do we prepare people? And so we're taking our training online and we're supporting them and making sure uh, you know, that they stay connected and that we support them mentally. We're doing mentoring, we're doing peer mentoring, um, you know, and keeping them connected. But these community organizations, many of them, just like TCBN and Parkdale and others, are doing this incredible work on the ground. And yet, the, the, the recovery dollars that the government is, um, is supporting is, is mainly uh, aimed at uh, private businesses. Um, you know, you have to have seen a decrease in your, um, in, in your revenues um, over the last uh, year in order to be able to benefit from the 75% uh, of, uh, you know, staff uh, payroll subsidy that the government is providing. But in the, on, on the other hand, you have community organizations who've actually not, they've taken up more work their workload has gone through the roof and their, their finances might not have suffered during this time, but that also should be considered instead of just looking at those who've actually lost money because community organizations are being relied upon more yeah. um, during this time of crisis. Yeah, I mean, I, we're out of time, folks, and I, I just want to say that, that so much of what you all have said is th this chat function stays open for another 30 minutes and they'll all keep chatting, which is tremendous. You've all raised so many interesting points here about whether, what the, whether we can actually sustain the conversations that we're having with people that and what that community uh, the de definition of community is Zita as you suggested how do we have that tri-level intermediary conversation uh, Rosemary we're very focused at the CUI about how do we actually look at new relief programs to keep main streets going and Ted we're always interested to hear what the thinking is coming out of the democracy collaborative so I want to just thank all of you uh, for participating with us uh, I think you've challenged us all because you know we all have money some of us have money to spend right now those of us that are lucky enough to have salaries or have income support, we can choose how we spend our money and we can choose to support local. We can choose to try to find ways to sustain the, the community around us as many of us are, are trying to do. Um, we have another one of these sessions, City Talk on uh, Friday. It's a one-on-one -on -one with me and Jay Pitter uh, to talk about uh, an urbanist wake up call, what's not happening in this conversation and how do we need to be framing it differently. Uh, and I just wanna thank you again, uh, Ted, Colette, Zita and Rosemary for joining us. Uh, and being so uh, thoughtfully uh, provocative and I think inspiring. Uh, I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you.